All right. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the very first online Spintronics seminar. I hope you are all doing fine. Uh, now, before we started our seminar, I uh, just want to give you a couple of reminders. Now, the seminar and the Q&As are being recorded. And if you haven't done so already, please update your name in Zoom so that when the moderator uh, call you, they can call your right name. And uh, please keep your audio muted uh, during the, uh, the, the presentation. Our uh, first talk is given by uh, Professor uh, Peng Li. Dr. Peng Li is an assistant professor at Auburn University. He was a postdoc of Professor Min Wu at Colorado State University and a postdoc of Professor Yuri Suzuki at Stanford University. His current research is focused on building spintronic devices with 2D materials, topological insulators, and complex oxides. So without further ado, uh, Peng, would you please take from here? Yes, thank you, Professor Xinfan. So can everybody hear me clearly? Is there an echo? No, it's fine. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, my name is Peng Li, and I joined the Auburn University last August. Um, so first, I want to I wanna say thanks to uh, Professor Xinfan and Professor Carrillo Palaschenko for organizing this spintronic seminar. Uh, this is an unusual time and where many of us are very anxious. I guess that's why we are all very quiet today. But I think this seminar gives us opportunities to learn and uh, to learn about each other's research and keep us occupied so we won't be uh, uh, very uh, anxious about the virus. And also we have some colleagues in the areas which are more heavily affected by the virus. And I just want to let you know we're all here for you. So, uh, so this is a very good community. Okay, so let's get, get back to the presentation. So uh, the work that I'm going to present today, uh, they were carried out when I was a postdoc at Professor Min Zhong Wu's group at Colorado State University. And uh, some of the works are, were carried out at Professor Yuri Suzuki's group. Uh, at Stanford University. So um, I think recently we know a good news that the spin transfer torque MRM has been in, uh, has, has been in production, especially by the big players such as TSMC, Samsung, and Everspin. So this is an exciting time for us who are working on spin trolics. The main mechanism for writing the information bit in uh, the MRM is based on the principle called spin transfer torque induced switching. And this is a nice cartoon I grabbed from Professor Xinfan's group. So it, uh, so, so it's, uh, it illustrates that uh, the spin filtering effect, when we have electrons passing through one ferromagnet, it gains angular momentum and passing it into the next ferromagnet and switch its magnetization. And this is the principle for MRM units such as uh, MTJ to work. So in an MTJ device, we have three layers and uh, one of the layers is free layer. And in the previous generations, the free layer was designed to have in-plane anisotropy. But uh, later on, uh, uh, people have found that if we wanna increase the recording density, we need to, uh, uh, we need to change the free layer from in-play magnetic material to so-called PMA material, which are magnetic materials with perpendicular anisotropy. So, um, so, this, this, the, uh, so this is a very uh, useful technique to realize high density recording bit for MRM. But recently it was found that the STT based MRM has several issues such as uh, it needs very high current density to write a bit. And also the switching speed is dependent, uh, is, is based on processional switching. So the speed may not be as fast as SRAM. So that's uh, in this context, several groups has proposed the use of spin orbital torque induced switching to write a bit. And in this configuration, we usually have a heterostructure with a heavy metal such as platinum 
uh, and a PMA material such as a very thin layer of co cobalt and uh, another uh, oxide layer. And so uh, when we want to switch the cobalt layer mechanization, what we do is we, we input a current into the junction and that induces spin polarized electrons due to spin hole effect. And uh, when the spin polarized electrons arrives at the, uh, in the cobalt layer, it, uh, the spin orbit torque actually switches the cobalt and to uh, switch its magnetization. So our, our information bit can be, can be written. And so uh, can, to, can we have, so we have so, so many new materials recently. We have 2D materials, uh, topological insulator materials. Do we have, so do those materials can provide a higher uh, charge to spin current conversion? And uh, the answer is yes, as many of us know. Uh, for example, one of those materials uh, is called topological insulator. And the, so the topological insulator uh, is a material with a non-trivial symmetry protected topological order. And so the interior of this material will be insulating, but the surface has some conducting channels. And those conducting channels, they are topologically protected uh, both by the partial number conservation and time reversal symmetry. And so there are several interesting effects from topological insulators that we can use for spintronic research, uh, such as spin momentum locking, uh, quantum anonymous Hall effect, uh, X ion insulator, and uh, those chiral mode conduction channels. But in this talk, I will be mostly talking about how can we use spin momentum locking to drive some of the switching uh, in uh, magnetic, uh, magnetic materials, which are called the magnetic insulator materials. So it's, so it's very natural for us to think about the idea to combine a topological insulator with a ferromagnet. And actually, this experiment was done by, uh, by many groups recently. And here lists the uh, representative works and combining a topological insulator with, uh, with a material which has magnetization with, his, uh, with, with a perpendicular allosotropy. And as you can observe that uh, they all successfully achieved spin orbital torque switching and with, very imp uh, with more improved efficiency than using a heavy metal. But the common point is that all those ferromagnet materials, they are conductive. So this can have two possible issues. So the first the issue is that uh, the current not only goes into the topological insulator layer, but also goes into the ferromagnet layer. And usually uh, the topological insulator has a much higher resist, uh, resist, resistivity than the ferromagnet. So that means most of the current actually ends up in the ferromagnet layer and that wastes, wastes a lot of current. Also induces unnecessary heat. So the other poss possible issue is that uh, because we have electrons from the ferromagnet, so they can interact with the electrons uh, from the topological surface state. So they can have interaction. So that interaction may actually effect, affect the topological surface states. So this has actually been studied uh, uh, recently as a very hot topic. So for example, uh, this is a theoretical work carried out by Professor uh, Brandy Safe Nikolic Group at University of Delaware. So they calculated the band diagram of a bismuth satellite, which is a, a typical topological insulator. And they have found that if we don't have any, if we just have pure bismuth satellite layer, we can actually have a very clear direct cone right in the uh, center of the conduction band and the valence band. Now, if, 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 if they uh, add a larger thin layer of cobalt, so uh, in this case, they added one layer of cobalt and the situation has changed dramatically from, from, uh, from the case with no ferromagnet layer. 
in the sense that the direct cone has been pushed into uh, toward the valence band and also some additional surface state band can arise. Um, so when they add more cobalt layers, uh, they have found that uh, sometimes the direct cone can be completely, completely damaged. So this is a, this is a theoretical prediction that when we have a ferromagnet uh, together uh, in, a, in a hydro structure with a topological insulator, the band structures of the surface state can be totally ruined. And we also have some experimental uh, evidence showing this can be true. So for example, uh, in this case, so uh, in a room temperature alpha tin topological insulator, uh, the upper shows that it has very clear direct cone when the, we only have alpha tin layer. And when the, when the, uh, exp uh, when the others, when they added a very thin layer of iron, and you can see the, uh, this, the sur surface state bands have been suppressed. And then when they add a more iron layer, the surface states can be completely suppressed. So this told us that in a structure with a topological insulator and ferromagnet, we really have, we can really have those issues that I mentioned earlier. One is the shunning current. So the other one is that the topological surface state can be damaged or suppressed. So now can we solve this issue? So one of the direct solution uh, that, uh, that we can think of is that what if we replace the ferromagnet layer, uh, met metallic conducting layer with a ferromagnet that is not conducting. And for example, magnetic insulators uh, with those ferrites, uh, they, they, can, they are all insulators. So in this case, if we flow a charge current into the junction, the current only goes into the ferro, uh, the, the topological insulator layer, but not going to the ferromagnet insulator layer. And also uh, the topological surface state can be uh, largely preserved based on some theoretical predictions. And the material that we used in this experiment uh, is a type of ferrite and, the, and it's called barren hexagonal hexagonal ferrite. But the basic unit of this uh, M-type barren hexagonal ferrite are S-block and R-block. So each of those balls at the edge, they are oxygen. And each of the green balls, they are iron. With, so the different, uh, so the so solid and open represent they are in different sites. So for example, tri triangular sites or tetragonal sites. And the barren is represented as this pink ball, which is very big. So it can replace the position of, of, the, of the oxygen in the R block. And so this material is not, is not actually new. And it was uh, used a lot in the microwave devices. Um, and uh, so, uh, so, so, so this material, uh, but the, what, is, what is interesting is that, um, so if we look at the unit cell of this material, it, it has a very large unit cell. So um, because, of, because of the, uh, because, because of the, uh, the S block, R block, and S star and R block combination, the allosotropy field of this, uh, of, this, of this unit cell can be very, very large due to the symmetry breaking, as well as the ion in the triangular sites. So this gives this, mat this material very large intrinsic perpendicular allosotropy. But because it's an uh, insulator, so we don't have any electron scatterings. So that's why the damping constant can be very low. And definitely it's not, uh, we don't have any shunning current. So all of those advantages made us feel very uh, excited and, and, and uh, to study what if we replace the ferromagnet with a, fer uh, a conductive ferromagnet with a ferromagnetic insulator? So this experiment started like this. So first we grew uh, the bismuth satellite and barren hexagonal ferrite heterostructure. So here BAM stands for M-type barren hexagonal ferrite. And I will use this 
for the following talk. So we started with uh, aluminum oxide substrates, which has a 001 orientation, and it has the uh, same he hexagonal structure of the both the of, of both the barren ferrite as well as the bismuth sulfide. But in order to grow uh, barren ferrite, we used a, a technique uh, of a pulse laser deposition system uh, in Professor Min Jong Wu's group. And as you can see, uh, even this uh, even this mole molecule is very large. We still can we still can get very thin five nanometer thick barren hexagonal ferrite with very sharp strips uh, from the read image, showing that this material has a single crystallinity. And then uh, we uh, send the sample to Professor Nitin Samath group at Penn State University. So they grew the top layer, which is bismuth satellite uh, of six nanometers in an MBE chamber. And they also, uh, so they monitor the read before and after the growth. And as you can see, both layers individually, they have very good uh, crystal crystallinity. So um, what, what about the, uh, what if we look into the microstructure using TM? So here shows example. So the bottom is aluminum oxide and the uh, second layer is barium hexagonal ferrite. And as you can see, um, so majority of the lattice is, uh, is very clear and showing that we have single crystallinity. Uh, and then on top of that is bismuth satellite. Um, so at the interface, we have, uh, I think, less than one angstrom layer being a little irregular at some parts uh, due, to the, due to the lattice mismatch. If we consider the lattice mismatch of the bismuth satellite and the barium hexagonal ferrite, we can see it, uh, the lattice is, is pretty different. But uh, surprisingly that we get only uh, a very, very, very thin layer uh, of, of this uh, irregular pattern. And most of the bismuth satellite layer is still single crystalline. And so this tells us that, that using the bismuth satellite and barium hexagonal ferrite combination, we are able to make an uh, epitextual structure uh, that, uh, that can help to build a more efficient spin orbital torque switching device. So when we first look at the uh, magnetic properties of barium hexagonal ferrite, so what we did is we uh, measured the hysteresis loops uh, in the outer plane direction and also in the in plane direction. And the outer plane direction hysteresis loop is uh, demonstrated by this blue curve. And you can see it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, very, it's a smooth curve. And uh, so that means we have a single phase magnetization and the remolence is not, is not, very, is uh, is not very high, uh, but uh, uh, this, is, this can also be explained by uh, the several layers close to the substrate being not perfectly lattice mismatched. But when we get to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, a little thicker, the magnetization is actually, uh, uh, the lattice will be better. And we can also see that the hard axis is aligned in plane. And from, from this both of curves, we can have an estimate of the allosorgy field for this sample, uh, which is measured to be about 22 kilo Ersteins. And this is a very, very large, uh, about 2.2 Tesla allosorgy field. So we also measure the magnetization as a response of the temperature. And, as, and, and this is very typical uh, measurement as we see in, in many other ferromagnetic materials. So we use the uh, block equation to evaluate, to estimate its uh, pure temperature. So the pure temperature is about 751 Kelvin, which is uh, much higher than the room temperature. So the switching field during different temperatures is uh, almost similar. So, so, so this means that even uh, even our magnetization has increased due, uh, when the temperature lowers, our switching field still keeps the same. So we can expect a similar uh, switching field property at different temperatures. So after we measured 
its magnetic property, uh, uh, what the, what we then pattern this device into a whole bar and measure, try to measure its whole resistance. So, so to the first thing we try to understand is how the carrier density changes with temperature. So uh, by, my, by doing this measurement, what we're actually measuring is the Hall effect in the bismuth satellite layer. So as you can see, the Hall effect is, is very strong and the uh, ordinary Hall co coefficient is very large. And at, uh, with, so with different temperatures, this uh, Hall coefficient, uh, uh, actually the Hall coefficient increases with uh, lowering the temperature. So from that, we can estimate the carrier density. Uh, so as, as you can see, with lowering the temperature, uh, our carrier density also decreases. And we did an analysis to uh, separating the carrier density from both the topological surface state, the bulk, and also due to the two deck, two deck layers. And they all follow similar, similar uh, carrier density, it means that at low temperature, uh, our, our conductivity uh, uh, actually uh, uh, actually uh, changes. So, so, that, so basically what we concluded here is that with temperature change, the Fermi level, they, uh, you know, at room temperature, the Fermi level is way above the direct home, deep in the conduction band. But with lowering temperature, it actually effectively moved toward the direct home and to the to the edge of the conduction band. So that means that at low temperature, uh, we can have more conducting channels uh, in, on the surface, but less conducting channels in the bulk from this measurement. Um, so we also measure the uh, resistance uh, and the conductivity versus the temperature. And what we found is that with decreasing temperature, our conductivity increases and that is because of uh, the electron phonon scattering reduction with uh, decreasing temperature. And our Fermi level is shifts to the bottom of the conduction band. Um, but if we look more carefully uh, toward the uh, very low temperature, uh, so below 25 Kelvin, uh, below 25 Kelvin, not only we have the Fermi level shift, but we also have a quantum correction. So that's why we have the turning point here. So based on that, uh, we, uh, we, we understood that lowering temperature in our sample, they can uh, effectively uh, eliminate the electron phonon scattering. So it's possible uh, that, that because of this, uh, our, our surface state can have a better efficiency in generating the spins and to switch our magnet. So, uh, so after we subtract the whole ordinary Hall coefficient, we actually, we actually try to measure the anonymous Hall effect. So, uh, so if we compare the magnetization measurement of this sample uh, with both the bismuth satellite and barium hexagonal ferrite and the anonymous Hall measurement, we can actually see that uh, the curves can be correlated, especially their corrosivity is very, very similar. So, uh, so that means that we can use anonymous Hall effect as a probe to tell if this sample, if, if the bottom magnetic layer is pointing up or pointing down. So, uh, so we tried the measurement that, uh, that we, we flow a current and this current only flows in the bismuth cellular layer. And then we measure the anonymous Hall response to see if this resistance can be changed when we sweep the current. And so in this case, uh, we have to break the, the symmetry by applying a in-plane magnetic field. And so in this, uh, by doing that, we can tilt the magnetization from, from outer plane to slightly, so to slightly in-plane. And now with the current added to the bismuth satellite layer, it will generate uh, the, spin, uh, the spin accumulation due to, due to both the bulk effect as well as the topological surface effect. And, and they can actually generate the spin orbital torque. So if we, flip the, if we flip the current this way, the spin orbital torque field can point in toward the 
outer plane direction. And if we change the current direction, then the spin orbital torque can reverse its direction. And this is uh, the, uh, the spin orbital torque symmetry. So we did this experiment. We monitored the anonymous hole and by sweeping the current. Uh, so, at, uh, so at this temperature, 200K and, and uh, the uh, in-plane magnetic field about, and it's actually very large due to our very large allosotropy field. So we can actually see that the resistance actually changed when we flip the current from positive to negative. And then if we change the current direction, the resistance can be flipped back from pointing down to point up. So that means uh, that we can achieve uh, the spin orbital torque induced the switching. So we repeated this experiment at different uh, temperatures. Um, and as you can see from those curves, with decreasing temperature, the critical current to decide the switching, uh, they actually uh, decrease the slightly. So as, as we analyzed earlier, uh, this is uh, due to the reduced bulk conductivity and uh, enhanced the surface conductivity. So that we have, we have more efficiency uh, from uh, more, more surface state electrons that are acting as the mechanism to generate the spin orbital torque. So we also uh, try to change the in-plane magnetic field from uh, negative to positive. And we saw that the hysteresis loops evolve in opposite direction. So that means uh, it, it is not uh, a heat, heating effect. Instead, it's the real spin orbital torque effect. In order to characterize the spin orbital torque field, so we did a, this experiment, uh, in which case that we fix the current to be one mini ampere. And we uh, measure the hysteresis loop to see how much the corrosivity change uh, at positive and negative current at 3K. So in this case, uh, because the current can modulate, uh, can, can actually uh, generate a spin orbital torque field and this field can modulate the corrosivity. That's why at a certain current, we can see that the corrosivity is very large. And in the other case, when we flip the polarity of the current, uh, because our spin orbital torque flipped to the opposite direction, so that the, so one is helping the switching process, one is impeding the switching process. That's why we measure the very different corrosivity. So by using this method, we repeated this measurement at a series of temperatures. And so for example, this plot, uh, this plot shows that our switching field as a function of temperature, and when we have the current fixed at minus one mini ampere, and what we see is that our switching field de decreases very, uh, decreases, especially at low temperatures, it, it has a very sharp uh, decrease, the reduction. But when we switch the polarity, we saw that the switching field increased very sharply. So by, um, so, so by, by finding the difference of the positive and negative current, we can find a way to estimate the uh, switching field efficiency. So we define the switching field efficiency as uh, the switching field at a positive current and, and the difference between that and, the, and also the switching field as a negative current and divide by two and then divide by the current density. And so we measured this blue curve for the business satellite bearing hexagonal ferro assembly. And as you can see, with decreasing temperature, the efficiency increases with decreasing temperature. And how, so how about a, another sample with platinum bearing ferrite? As you can see, for this sample, the efficiency almost keeps constant and it has slight increment with decrease in temperature. And the reason we choose platinum, uh, which is also has the same thickness of the business satellite, is that we wanna study if this is purely due to the bulk spin hole effect, uh, how, much, how much switching field we can, we can uh, change. And as you can see, 
the bismuth sunlight is much more efficient than uh, platinum, one has spin moment locking effect. The other just have spin hole effect, so they can be very, very different. So um, in order to evaluate the exact uh, spin orbital torque field, we use the micromagnetic simulations. So this simulation can correlate the change of the switching field and the actual value of the spin orbital torque together. And so based on that, we estimated that as at room temperature, we had uh, about, uh, about 10 Ersted uh, spin orbital torque field. But when the temperature decreases to about 3K, uh, this spin orbital torque field can be as large as around 4,000 4, Ersted. So, so, so that's why we think this is because of the spin momentum locking effect due to the surface state uh, of the topological insulator. So for this uh, T-tour structure, bismuth satellite and barium hexagonal ferrite, uh, if we want to summarize it, we, we can see that we uh, observed the uh, current, uh, current induced the switching by the spin orbit torque effect. And this efficiency is 300, 300 times bigger uh, at, three, at 3K than at room temperature. And also is much bigger than a heavy metal heat or, uh, heat or structure. So the other, uh, the other system that I also uh, investigated uh, briefly is that if we combine bismuth satellite with a low loss magnetic uh, uh, insulator called magnesium aluminum ferrite. So this is a, this, this aluminum, this, so this is a structure that has a spin mill ferrite structure. And so in order to make this structure, we uh, use the very, we use the pulse laser deposition system, but we only process it at five, 450 C. So it's closer to the uh, CMOS requirement of low, low temperature annealing process. Uh, but the benefit of this material is that it has very low ferromagnetic resonance field. So we don't have to, if we want to use it for microwave or, uh, or other spin orbital torque oscillator devices, we can actually uh, just use very low frequency. Uh, we can actually use very low uh, resonance field to drive it to oscillation. Uh, considering it has both low ferromagnetic resonance field and also uh, 10 times smaller damping constant compared with, uh, with a ferromagnetic metal. Even though this has a different structure than bismuth satellite, uh, we were still able to grow um, the single crystal uh, bismuth satellite on top of this structure in collaboration with Professor Litin Samad group. Um, so so there, here the XRD uh, scans shows that uh, both of the layers, both the magnesium aluminum ferrite layer and bismuth satellite layer has single crystallinity. And so we did a measure, we did a, so this work is still being studied, but what we have seen is that we are able to use uh, the spin torque ferromagnetic resonance to excite uh, microwave oscillation in the manifold through the business satellite layer. And even though the signal to noise ratio is not perfect, but uh, we can use th those curves to have a rough estimate, estimate of the spin hole angle. So if we do that estimation, so this spin hole angle at room temperature is about 0.283. So this value is consistent with, with uh, several other works that have been, have, have been reported. But the difference uh, between uh, this structure and other structures is that, is that the, the magnesium aluminum ferrite layer is also a magnetic insulator. So uh, all the current only goes into the business satellite. So we can, we can essentially uh, make sure that we are actually measuring the topological surface state. So to summarize, uh, uh, our research has, uh, has proposed new platforms to study the, uh, the, the spin current transport uh, by combining topological insulator and a class of magnetic insulators. So both on, uh, so there are two class of 
uh, insulators. One is the barium hexagonal ferrite. The other one is the spindle ferrite. And they all have very low magnetic damping constant. So they can be used to build uh, many interesting spintronic devices. So, so finally, I want to say thanks to uh, all my collaborators, especially my advisors, uh, Min Zhong Wu, Yuri Suzuki, and uh, Wolfgang Porot, uh, Bern, uh, Gary Bernstein. Thank you very much. And uh, I will be very happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you very much, Peng. Uh, so now this uh, seminar is open for questions. If I have questions, please uh, use a raise hand. All right, Dr. E. Lee, you're the first. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, uh, yes. Thanks, thank you very much for your nice talk. And uh, I just, just uh, noticed one uh, thing is, is when you studied the magnetic insulator and the topological insulator, you first grow your magnetic insulator in one lab and ship the sample into uh, Penn State and uh, have the second layer grown by MBE, right? So I'm just, just right. wondering uh, how can you, uh, what's, what's, uh, how can you take care of the, the interface? To say, uh, do you like heat up this, this do, do, do you do something special at the interface in order to ensure and epitaxial growth for the second layer. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, interesting, interesting question. So uh, that was definitely an issue uh, when we started this project. So we started this project back in 2014 and uh, uh, 2015, and we were not too able to get any uh, anonymous Hall effect after uh, Professor Litton's Samath group sent back the sample. Um, so, so that's why later on when we uh, collaborated, we try to, uh, we, we try to brainstorm some ideas. So uh, the latest uh, process uh, that, uh, that we are doing, uh, I think is that uh, before we ship the sample, uh, we uh, definitely, so, so, so I think, okay, so we definitely use very good vacuum uh, sealing, but then when the sample was put in the MBE system, uh, it will it will it will be heated up to about uh, 300 to 400 Celsius, and then uh, doing some pre-flux of the of the business or selenium, and by doing that for several hours, they started to grow. They started the growth process. So so later on, this process was proved to be effective to. Uh, make sure that we have a better interface between the two materials. Uh, but it was, uh, a, so, so I would say, uh, so based on different fabrication process, it, the e efficiency, is, e the effect is different. Thanks. Thank you. All right, do you have other questions? Uh, Dr. Hua Chen. Uh, hi, uh, Peng. Very nice talk. Uh, I, this is the first time that I heard this uh, material of uh, uh, MGAL FEO uh, compound. Uh, would you like to tell me a little bit more about it? Uh, what, what made you um, first think about this uh, material? And uh, what, uh, what other interesting properties uh, does this material have? Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, uh, so this material, magnesium aluminum ferrite, uh, it was, uh, so this, this one was actually developed by uh, Professor Saturo Emery when he was a postdoc at Stanford University. So it's a, it has a spinel ferrite uh, structure. And uh, so I think the, 
main idea when he was trying to develop it is, is that he, he wanted to minimize the uh, spin orbit coupling. And um, so, so he found this material that can be engineered uh, straightforward on a magnesium uh, aluminum, fer uh, aluminum substrate. Uh, but later on, uh, we found that the, uh, the allosotropy, uh, so ba based on different substrate, we can induce the allosotropy in in-plane direction. So for example, in this case, if we grow it on uh, 100 magnesium ferrite substrate, then the easy axis is in-plane. Uh, so, but if we grow it on a Galley substrate uh, with 101 orientation, then this material can also have outer plane allosotropy. So that's a little similar to the famous TIG we always uh, we always uh, we always hear from the uh, from the community that it uses the strain to induce the outer plane allosotropy, but uh, I think in both of the cases the damping constant can be kept uh, to be around the point oh one, uh, so that is the that is, I think that's the highlight for this material. Um, so the other so I think the other highlight uh, uh, the, the my colleagues will start to introduce is, is that uh, when, it, when it was growing with business satellite, the interface was very, was very clear and there was no interdiffusion between uh, this MAFO and business satellite. And, uh, uh, and we can measure very good proximity effect uh, at a variety of temperatures. So, that, that, uh, so this research is still being uh, in progress. So I think, uh, we, will, we can give a more comprehensive update very soon. Uh, so uh, just a one short follow-up question uh, for the, uh, for the bilayer system that you grown, uh, it, it, did you use the one-on-one uh, surface orientation of the... Uh, of so, in, in, so, so in that sample, we uh, use the one zero zero substrate actually. Yeah, uh, but it's possible to use, but we can use one-on-one substrate uh, so the, how, how does the, the, the symmetry of the two, uh, two layers uh, match each other? Uh, so, uh, so there are, so, those, so the symmetry can match uh, because we can match the one one of this cubic structure with the, uh, with the zero zero one uh, C, pl C plane of a business satellite. So it's possible to to match it, and I think the lattice, lattice parameter can difference is is very small. Uh, so I, I might have misheard. Uh, you mean for the structure that you already grow, uh, you used the one zero zero orientation. That's right. Yes. Uh, so in that uh, structure, uh, the the symmetry of the substrate or the symmetry of the MA. F O is not the same as uh, the uh, business satellite, but you are going That's to right. go on. Okay. Yeah. So in so in the one one zero zero case, uh, we actually have a very uh, different lattice, but uh, still uh, we we can grow uh, the business satellite uh, to be a single crystal. So, uh, but we are now studying uh, using T M to see if there is uh, if there are any data layers. But, uh, but I would assume so, because the two, two structures have very different lattices. Okay, thank you. Thank you, yeah. All right, Yang, yeah, you got the next question? Uh, yeah, uh, th thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Lee. It's a very nice talk. So, um, so I saw two uh, benchmarks on the SOTM efficiency. The first one is the switching current density, it, uh, it, it is reduced by about 40% 40, 40 from room temperature to 3K. And the other one uh, you used is the difference in the switching field of positive and negative currents. Uh, this is increased by 300 uh, times. Uh, so which one do you think better represents the charge to spin uh, conversion efficiency? Okay, yeah. Thank you very, thank you very much for your uh, good question. So, 
so the uh, so so this uh, switching field efficiency is something that uh, we use in our in our experiment, but 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 then we can actually correlate the switching field efficiency with the spin orbital torque through numerical simulations. And after we establish this relationship, then we can go ahead and, and to estimate the spin orbital torque field. Well, I think this is a more uh, easy way to benchmark with other similar systems. Uh, so that's, I hope that can answer your question. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think uh, it is good to have uh, to 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 be able to switch the magnet easier, uh, but maybe there are other mechanisms. For example, uh, I remember from my memory in your paper the platinum BAM, uh, the 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 eta the switching field efficiency is also increased by about an order of magnitude from room temperature to low temperature. So this is different from the Smithall effect. So I I. I think there might be some other mechanisms that helps the, the increase of this difference in switching fields. Yeah, um, I, I, okay, I, I really like your uh, question. So uh, you are saying for, even for the platinum barren ferrite sample, the switching field efficiency for the platinum also increased uh, with decrease in temperature, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, we uh, definitely observed that. So, um, so, so there are, so there are several uh, possibilities. Uh, I, I saw different papers have different uh, results, but for, for our sample, uh, as, as, I saw, as I showed earlier, because our switching field is constant, and, uh, but, if we, but if we lower the temperature, even for platinum, uh, the reason why the switching field efficiency increases can be reduce the electron phonon scattering in the platinum layer, similar to the mechanism of the, uh, of the bismuth satellite sample. But for the bismuth satellite sample, the electron phonon scattering affects more strongly on the surface state electrons. For, for the platinum sample, uh, it affects more on the uh, bulk electrons. Mm. Yeah. So the, uh, if you have any comments, I, I will be happy to discuss with you further. Okay, uh, and my second question is on the on the characteristic of bismuth cyanide. So uh, I measured bismuth cyanide grown by Dr. Stephanie Law School, and it's it, it's bismuth cyanide on getting arsenic. From my measurement, the the characteristic doesn't change much over the uh, from five k to three hundred k. So did, did you uh, measure stand alone? Uh, I mean, single piston sana. Uh, yeah, so, so it's different from your earlier sample. Right, yeah, yeah I, I, I think I understand your question. So, uh, so I think there are uh, different variations of topological insulator. So the business satellite we have is two to three. And we, uh, so I, I think we see very similar responses when the bismuth satellite is growing on a, pl a blank aluminum oxide substrate uh, and also on the barren hexagonal ferrite. So there are some differences, but I, I don't see a very um, sharp difference between the two samples. So I, I would say that is possible uh, because, our, because the, the element atomic ratios are slightly different. So can that uh, induce the difference? Mm, yeah, and here uh, for the conductivity downturn at, at about 25K. So I also observed similar down, down uh, let's say the, 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 the change for the mm -hmm. business sana growing on, on the egg sample. Mm, so what, what's this mechanism? So it doesn't, it doesn't go to a plateau instead. Uh, it, it, it's, so yeah, you are talking about the the turning point here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so we think this is because uh, of the electron electron blocking uh, or so called quantum correction effect. That that, that so this is actually the part uh, I, I believe in the paper we we 
also are not quite sure. Um, mm. Yeah, okay. the, but I think a neutral explanation is quantum correction, but it can be possible that uh, this is something totally that uh, we don't understand. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Roberto, please ask the next question. Okay, thanks. Hello. Um, I, I, have a, I have a very basic question. And at the beginning, you say that the, um, the topological insulator that you consider uh, is the, the topological states are protected by time reversal symmetry, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I just wonder, I, I, I am just wondering um, when, you con when you couple the, the topological insulator with the, with the, with the ferromagnets, the, ferromag the ferromagnetic uh, sample uh, break the time reversal symmetry by, by definitions. So I, I wonder if you can comment about that. What are the consequences of, of that? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Roberto. Okay. So, um, so I, I think uh, that in our sample uh, with bismuth satellite and barium hexagonal ferrite, uh, as you mentioned, uh, because uh, we, the barium hexagonal ferrite is a magnetic material, so it will break the uh, it will break the symmetry of uh, one surface of the topological insulator. So, uh, so it's possible that the, so that definitely will, can have an effect on the topological surface state. Uh, if we think about the band structure, so the band uh, direct cone can have a small gap. Uh, but, uh, but because our Fermi level is still uh, pretty distant, from the direct, from the direct point, so uh, we think that at the Fermi level, uh, that in our sample, uh, our spin moment and locking effect is still uh, not affected. If if even though it's affected, it's not affected very, very dramatically, uh, because our Fermi level is not at at that gap. Okay, thanks. And and the second question is about is um, about of the um, another possibilities. Uh, have you considered the options to um, consider instead of a ferromagnetic insulator uh, some kind of anti-ferromagnetic samples, for instance? Um, could you comment about that? Uh, I think that will be a great idea if you can have an anti-ferromagnet uh, insulator uh, with with a topological insulator. So for, yeah, I, I think that's, that's, a, that's, a great, uh, that's a great idea. Uh, especially uh, recently, uh, we, we all know that the, there, there are some other materials that integrate anti-ferromagnetism in topological insulator. So they can have a lot of uh, interesting phenomenon uh, such as quantum autonomous hall and axial ion insulators. Um, uh, but I believe if we have a heterostructure of bismuth satellite and anti-ferromagnet, then we may also have much more uh, improved efficiency to realize the spin, uh, spin orbital torque switching in anti-ferromagnet as well. Okay, thanks. Thank you.